others. Uh, we have books for sale uh, back there, but this is, let's look beyond the cover. And who are the people who've written these books? What are their stories? What's contributed? What was it that, that you said? How did we get here? <laughs> and I love that. So we have Kat, Carol McCann and, uh, and Catherine uh, Kelly Mann. And uh, I'm going to introduce a little bit uh, about both of them. But um, I just like to say that uh, when someone says, I'm a writer, uh, you go, oh, and you think you understand what that means. Well, one of the purposes of this series is for everyone to understand, no, this is complex. This is the, the genres, the writing of the genres requires different thinking, different approaches. And so uh, we've had uh, some, uh, several of the writers who contributed, Jan in the front row, and Bob next week. And this is an opportunity to really understand the, the differences that come into play when someone is writing. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, the purpose is to uh, learn about what we writers have in common and what's different. So when you're listening, hi, uh, when you're listening, um, be, be thinking uh, about, hmm, now she did that? Wow, that's pretty interesting. She worked as a children's librarian. Hmm. Tell me more, Catherine. Uh, so be thinking uh, as you're listening to what accounts for the person getting here and their approach and take away something, hopefully, if you're, if you're writers. Um, so our first author is uh, Catherine Kelly Mahon. And uh, in education, she has an AB, which is Bachelor of Arts. Uh, graduated magna cum laude in English and sociology, um, and undergraduate degree at uh, Emmanuel College in Boston, and a bachelor's at Seton Hall University in New Jersey, master's degree at Framingham State in special education. Um, and right away I'm thinking, hmm, how does that come into play with this leprechauns? Uh, <laughs> And um, master's in education, that was from um, UMass. And a certificate of advanced graduate study, postgraduate studies in family systems and therapy uh, at uh, Cambridge Family Institute, Cantor Family Institute, Northeastern University, and New England School of Alcoholic Studies. So there's a lot of scholarship behind this particular author. Hi. How are you? Um, so Catherine worked several years in counseling, did social work with children, adolescents, and families in schools and uh, community agencies and treatment facilities, and worked several years in office management for attorneys and CPAs. But she says, of the many positions I felt I think my favorite was children's librarian at Leslie School for Children in Cambridge, which I did for several years while I was involved in special education came to the Cape from Boston in 1995 and has participated in writing groups at uh, Four Cs Academy for Lifelong Learning, uh, taken summer workshops at um, Cape Cod Writers Conference, and at the Arts Alliance is a uh, uh, coordinator in a memoir writing group and a member, member of a writing group. And you can tell us all about your, your writing projects, especially those leprechauns. The books are for sale over here, and we'll, we'll hear all about them. So, thank, thank you, Christy. Yeah. <laughs> well, as you said, how did I get here? As you heard, it's been a very circuitous <laughs> route, <laughs> but it all kind of fits together. Like you know, Act One and Act Two, which involved all that education and working in you know the professions, so, you know, counseling and family therapy. Um, that led to my wanting to write a memoir <coughs> called Celtic Connections, which is a history and memoir of the Kalimangan family. But probably um, the probably the most um, important factor is the fact that my parents were Irish immigrants, so I'm first generation. And that experience, I think, infuses everything. Not only the um, desire to write this, 
But I, I was remembering what Christy said last week about how when she writes, she writes uh, nonfiction. She feels a obligation to both her subject matter and to the audience. Um, well, in memoir, the sub, you know, the obligation is a little less strict, I think, because it's your story. But um, for me, I think the obligation or the burning desire to do this had to do with wanting to preserve the story of immigration, because I witnessed full, firsthand um, the sacrifices that are made when people leave home in, in those days, never to return. Um, so um, when I, this I just wrote for my family, so it's not something I sell. Um, but when I, on the uh, acknowledgments page at the bottom, I took a, a model from the um, Irish American Hall of Fame, which in English reads, remember the people from whom you came. So that's part of what this is all about. Um, the way, I, the way um, I happened to get started on this was in the 70s, my aunt Sarah, Sarah Manhattan on my father's side, she, she died and um, left behind was this small battered brown suitcase, which I claimed. <laughs> and in it were all these letters from Ireland, from her mother, from her father, copy of my grandfather's will, um, I think some old jewelry. So I acquired that in the 70s, and that was, you know, kind of sitting around, kind of haunting me a little bit, and I would look at it and be kind of fascinated. Um, so finally I decided I had to go to Ireland to find some lost relations, because my people all came, like my aunt came before World War One. Probably my father too, my mother came in the 1920s, right about the time of the Irish Civil War. Um, so then, well, Sarah went back, but for the most part, they didn't go back. So um, I put in this little note to the reader, so let them <laughs> let them know what is this madness all about, you know? So it just says a note to reader. During the summers of 1984 and 85. I traveled to my parents' birthplace in Ireland, searching for lost relations. That quest was prompted by, by my discovery of letters, photographs, and a last will and testament in an old suitcase belonging to my Aunt Sarah. What I learned on my journey then, in all of the years since, is the subject of this history in memoir. The courage and sacrifices of those who came to America and of those who remain at home in Ireland is truly inspiring to me. I hope, dear reader, your Kelly Mahan heritage will fill you with pride as it does me. So the key piece of um, paper was my grandfather's will <laughs> that was in this, because it mentioned that um, he left everything to his nephew, William Mahan. Um, and I was looking at it once and I, and at the dates, and I said, hmm, William Mann might still be alive. <laughs> I should go see if I can find him. <laughs> so um, that's what I was doing when I first went in 1984. And um, it was the, I brought now to the copy of my grandfather's will, and some family photographs, some uh, jewelry my grandfather had made, just to sort of let them know that I was for real. <laughs> so um, I just went to Dublin, and all I knew was they had a, a business in Selbridge, which is southwest of Dublin. So I went to the B&B in Selbridge and um, decided to walk into town, which was probably about a mile. Um, so I'm, I'm coming over this little bridge and um, coming into Selbridge. And I, I over the bridge, and then I looked down the street, and I said, wow, I'm all by myself. So I'm talking to myself a lot. <laughs> wow, this looks just like the, the street in the picture. Mm -hmm. So I walked down the street, and then on one side, I see this kind of worn out Raleigh bicycle sign that was, you know, rusted and looked like it was no longer a viable business. And I knew my grandfather had been in the bicycle business. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the old-fashioned varieties with <laughs> the sidecar and everything. 
So I started asking questions on the street about, um, you know, I don't anything about that sign, this is not on the here. And then there was someone down the street and the business was B. Nan, talked to her, and she wasn't a relative, but she says, you might want to talk to Willie Nan down the street here. Um, but he used to run a bicycle shop. They immediately click. Willie Nan, wasn't that the name of the nephew? I wasn't sure what. So I go back to my B and B and pull out the wheel and like, there it is, what do you mean? So um, I was hot to try to go to Selbridge the next morning <laughs> to see if in fact this was um, Willie Mayan, who would have been um, my father's nephew. Um, so anyways, here I am um, in Selbridge. Let's see, I need a, a marker here coming to knock on Willie Mayan's door. Oh, wait a minute, that's not... I'm ahead of myself here. <laughs> so anyways, I did... Um, I timidly knocked on the door and this, this woman who looked like, you know, maybe in her 70s came to the door and I says, um, I'm looking for Willie Mayan. Does he live here? And she says, oh, sure he does. Come in here. You know, not... Not the least bit concerned that I'm a perfect stranger. Um, so I came in, I'm standing in the hallway and wondering, you know, she goes down the hall and catch Will and I'm standing there, you know, what are they thinking about this American showing up at their front door? So Willie comes down the hall, um, immediately reminded me of my father. He had the, the features, he even like walked like my father. Um, and I said, um, did you know um, my uncle, John Mann, the man who wrote the will? And he said, oh, yes, I did. I'm his nephew. And I said, well, John Mann was my grandfather. Like, <laughs> well, we can't believe it. And um, we go into the parlor and we talk for some time, and I'm showing them the letters and the jewelry and all that. And he's showing me a watch. He made, my grandfather was a watchmaker, a jewelry maker, and the inventor of what they call the gas and bicycle which was the bicycle in the 1800s, I guess. Um, so, um, while I was talking with Willie, Mary, his wife, is down in the kitchen making all these frantic phone calls that I wasn't aware of <laughs> to her daughters to say, this American cousin has arrived, you know. <laughs> so they invited me to dinner. So I met, um, you know, Mary and Willie's daughters, um, who are my second cousins, Mar and Ellen in Carmel, and then in subsequent years they came here. But we never knew each other existed prior to this. Um, so that was the first trip, discovering, um, and when I left and said goodbye to everything, Willie really says, you know, I don't want to be so long in coming the next time. <laughs> you know, the big handshake, I don't be so long in coming. The so the next time was the following year, because um, I had discovered this uh, Kelly, you know, family members, but, I'm sorry, the Mayans, my father's side, and my mother's side is the Kellys. So I, I couldn't um, find anything the first time I was there, so I came home and I wrote a letter to the, um, the Westmeath Times saying that I was looking for lost relations, and I even enclosed a kind of a corny, sentimental poem I wrote when I was um, a youngster about wanting to go to Ireland to find my mother's people. I published that in the paper, so I guess <laughs> they drew some response, one of whom happened to be a man named Fonzie McCormick, who, who was present when my mother and her brother left Westmeath. So they wrote to me and they said, yes, they knew the Kellys and invited them to come. So when I went back the following year in 1985, I went to um, see Fonzie and his wife, who, and they, you know, they told me about the night that <coughs> my mother and her brother were leaving. And it, this was in the Midlands, um, right in the farm country. And uh, it's like what they talk about now, the American Wake, mm -hmm. that when you're leaving, they know you're not, they're not going to see you again. So um, this, that's what they call it. So after I talked with them, um, I went out walking the countryside because that was like where my mother grew up. Um, and he, he even pointed me in the directions of the Kelly homestead. Um, 
where I where I did go and met a woman named Connell. It wasn't related, but she had um, inherited the property. And the name of the house was Four Roads because it was a, an intersection like that where I guess was a popular spot because it was right at Four Roads. Um, so when I left there, I thought I was going back to Fonzie's house where my car was, but as soon as um, I realized I was on the wrong road. So as soon as I saw a long, low, one-story building, I realized I was on the wrong, wrong road, but was curious enough to continue walking toward it. Over the entrance was a sign that stopped me cold. My heart quickened as I read aloud, Streamstown School, 1900. My God, Mom probably went to the school. She would have been only three years old that year. And it turns out that was her school. I, and then I put in a little history about the school here and how I walked around and looked at the school and looked in the windows and you know took pictures. And then um, I was I heard some youngsters on the road. Um, okay, as I was. I continued walking, hope I was in the right direction. Very soon I came upon a small, white, stucco-like house from which came the welcoming sound of traditional Irish music and the less than welcoming sound of a barking dog. A black and white sheep dog emerged, tail waving and friendly welcome. <clears throat> we approached the open door together. Looking into a darkened room, my eyes took time to adjust to the sudden change from the brilliant sunshine to the country of the countryside. Seated between an old stove and a worn, faded, brown, upholstered chaise was an elderly woman in a purpose purple dress. Her dog jumped onto the chest chase and settled down beside her. She didn't seem alarmed by my unexpected appearance. Come in, dear, you're welcome. I introduced myself as Catherine Kelly, daughter of Nano Kelly, who grew up in the air. Nan Kelly, sure didn't I know her? Weren't we school chums? She came to my house every day, full of the devilment we were, always plotting and planning. So much as I wanted to believe her, it sounded too good to be true. My mother's girlfriend, girlhood friend, could it possibly be? What is your name, I asked. Nellie McCormick. I've lived here all my life. I remember her not like to recite a poem about little Nell. She studied my face, looked me straight in the eye, and <laughs> continued. Ah, uh, yes, Nan was full of bedevilment. Had the charity in her, too. Kind she was. Helped me get ready for a dance. Let me address her sister had sent from America. Did up my hair. Oh, a beautiful waltzer she was. There was great action about her. Six boys lined up waiting to dance. Ah, uh, but she was plucky. Thought none of the locals good enough for her. So she went to America to find her luck. <laughs> Recalling these scenes, Nellie closed her eyes, her face softened as she swayed back and forth in her chair in perfect waltz time. Decades disappeared as she was transported back to you. I no longer doubted Nellie. The near she, she knew was my mom. I knew my mother's devilish good humor, her pluckiness, kindness, generosity, the stories about the excitement, ex excitement of the annual village dance and her grace on the dance floor. This was not coincidence. Perhaps she had directed my footsteps down this road to see her school chum, see her school and meet her chum. So those were like the pivotal meetings. My mother's, see my mother's school, Nellie, and my father's, okay. I'm getting the signal. <laughs> I'm already running out of time. Um, just a few minutes about how I had, as I mentioned, in, even though I've had these many positions in family therapy and all that, um, my favorite drug was as a librarian. And um, how I happened to write about Seamus the Lost Leprechaun that came from a writing assignment um, here on the Cape where the assignment was to write about someone who comes from a, comes from outer space. <laughs> so for whatever reason, to me that turned out to be a leprechaun. It was a time when there was a lot of talk about undocumented aliens, and especially the undocumented Irish in the Boston area. 
So I wrote about Seamus, the leprechaun, who um, is from the Aran Islands, where there are a lot of um, fishermen, um, and that he is eager to um, protect them and protect the children, especially if there's a storm. So what he does is hop along the fishing boat and keep an eye on the storm. Um, and when he sees it approaching, he jumps over the, door, over the board and ends up washed ashore on Cape Cod. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I um, and he sells into the house in a, by a, that's owned by a woman named Kate. And because he's invisible, she doesn't know he's there. So that was in, uh, that was 10 years ago. So then, in the meantime, I'm finishing the family history. Um, but in the back of my head, it's like, well, what happens to Seamus after he's here on, on Cape Cod? <laughs> so that, this is Lost Leprechaun Cape Cod Adventures. It starts off with him um, waking up in, in Cape's house to sleep on the chair with the other one. Um, and momentarily he's wondering where he is, and he hears Kay on the phone talking about um, helping the children at the shelter um, and collecting slippers and clothing. Um, she starts to hear noises in the attic, so she goes up to investigate what's going on up here. Is it mice, squirrels, or whatever? Three o'clock in the morning, waking up. And what she sees is this all these pampoodies being made, which is the name for the um, footwear they wear in the Aran Islands. And she says, I oh, want you see these in the Aran Islands. Could there be a leprechaun in the house? So the next morning she says, Leprechaun, show yourself. There's a long silence. Leprechaun, show yourself. I'm a kinsman. Ah, there you are. I see a droopy hat. Come out from behind that big green chair. Don't be frightened. I'm a kinsman. My mom came from the Aran Islands. She, seen, she named me Katrina. You may call me Kate. What's your name? Here she is there introducing each other. And then he says he's from the Aran Islands. And um, he apologizes for waking him up. Um, and he says, Oh, I promise, Kate, so sorry I ever woke you in the middle of the night. I kept myself hidden because I didn't know you were a believer. Now, for, that's my favorite line in the whole story. <laughs> he didn't know I was a believer. Um, so because of his, um, experience, his concern for children and his skill at making um, footwear, he makes all these pampoodies for the shelter. See, like me, he was a social worker. <laughs> and they deliver them, and he gets lonesome because he wants to go back to um, home. He tells Kate a lot about the Aran Islands and about how he learned, um, you know, the craft of making shoe slippers and how he loved the children and wanted to protect them. And um, so they. Writing about a leprechaun had a lot to do with my Irish heritage and my desire to make it a cross-cultural experience. He speaks Irish, so the Irish language is in here. There's, you know, the stories that show where the Aran Islands are located, kind of. So it's, it's <clears throat> exposes children to all that, the language, the culture, the legend. Um, I better stop. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Uh, you hear the adventure of being a writer. You know, you might end up on a quest just like this. Uh, it's really fascinating to hear about that. Um, and our next author, uh, I'm going to sit down for this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is, it says everything about uh, Carolyn Lucan, but um, someone was commenting on her, on her artwork, and I, I mentioned, you know, she was quite the writer. And they went, writer? Really? <laughs> I didn't know she was a writer. So Carolyn is, is a, a dual talent here, and right up there, we'll get a picture of that a little later, is, is her scratchboard work. 
and all around this gallery is Carolyn's artwork. But um, we're going to talk about the, the writing uh, today and um, you know, maybe get some insights into what it's like, uh, how one incorporates those two talents, those two passions. Um, so to introduce um, uh, Catherine, she has a degree, Carolyn, uh, Carolyn sorry, <laughs> uh, in uh, uh, fine art from Rutgers University. Um, uh, and she minored in American Lit, studied 19th and 20th century American Lit, modern drama, creative writing, as well as painting and, and, and drawing and, and ceramics. So obviously you were incorporating the two. You were incorporating social work and your interest in family early in your academic life and you in, incorporating uh, literature. Um, and uh, summers during college, uh, she worked in the art department of a small publishing firm. And uh, after graduation, worked as a medical artist and photographer at Rutgers Medical School and freelanced uh, in artwork while raising children. Took up photography, developed her own film, and took courses at the New York Institute of Photography. Um, so this next, uh, if I gave you probably a hundred guesses, uh, you wouldn't have guessed a writer might have been engaged in 17 years in the defense industry. Uh, but Carolyn was at uh, GE, uh, Martin Marietta, Lockheed Martin, and General Dynamics. Um, and was an industrial artist and sometimes proofreader of defense materials. So we'll look avidly for a book that reflects the defense <laughs> background, right? Um, she's published two novels, a uh, book of short works, and a children's book, and is actively engaged in illustrating children's books for other writers. She facilitates the fiction group, so anybody here who is interested in joining that can see Carolyn after. And she's currently writing a contemporary novel. Um, and maybe when we get to the Q&A, you could be mentioning what, uh, what you're currently working on. Um, <laughs> so in Carolyn's world, creating visual art and writing fiction are incorporated and just a piece of who she is. So, so let's hear more about that. Uh, and the journey. I can add, I uh, certainly <laughs> am overwhelmed by it. Wonderful talent of this lady and her amazing experience. She so, just likes me because I come from right <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to start by reading a little cartoon, one of my favorites, Pearls Before Swine. I don't know if any of you have seen this. It's, it's just amazing. It's, it gets philosophically funny at many times, but this I thought was appropriate for, for this particular um, event. Uh, the first four cells are just, is just writing. Oh, this, by the way, is, is a mouse, a goat, and a pig who live together. And they live next door to a family of crocodiles who are mercilessly stupid. <laughs> so the first four cells are, are just writing. We don't know who's writing. Today I will waste seven hours. Then I'll be productive for just one hour. Then I'll hate everything I did. Then I'll think I'm a joke. Then I will take out all my frustration on the person closest to me. And now the mouse is writing. How to be a writer, chapter one. And the goat says, how appealing. And the pig says, when does the drinking start? <laughs> so I thought this kind of encapsulated how writers occasionally feel about themselves, especially at the beginning of their serious writing. Uh, I, uh, sorry, that's okay. I started writing when I was you know, six or seven, filling little notebooks with silly little stories and illustrating them. And usually they were written in crayon. Um, and my children still have these books and I'm glad hysterically when I read um, I graduated to a typewriter for my 12th birthday, what I asked my mother and father for, and I got one. And I just loved producing pages of work. It was so much better than working in school and going, you know, having to do the essays and everything else. Just writing for myself was, was wonderful. Um, as Christy, Christy mentioned, I did work for the defense industry for 17 years. 
and that has nothing to do with my writing. Um, having being in such a constricted atmosphere where my writing was well, I didn't actually write. I was proofreading technical work all the time and drawing technical illustrations of tanks and other equipment. Um, it was something that I just didn't want to infiltrate my outside world. So it kind of pushed me more in the direction of being more creative. I, I got away from that and I took up pen and ink drawing. Um, I was also raising children, so pen and ink drawing was a lot easier to do. There was no cleanup, virtually no cleanup when we were finished. And while I was working, people would ask me once in a while, can you write me a poem? So-and-so is retiring and we want a funny poem. So I kind of did little things here and there like that to appease my writing self. But I didn't really get into serious writing until I, I retired. And at that time, I said, I'm going to sit down, and the computers were just coming into being, which I credit for everything I write, because I don't know if I'd be a writer without a computer. Uh, I sat down and wrote a novel. It was a uh, Civil War era novel, and I thought, oh, this is great. I, I'm, I'm enjoying this so much. And when it was done, you know, and I was doing it just for myself, I never had any inkling that I would ever want to publish anything, though that would be wonderful. I mean, have a book with my name on the cover. Uh, and when I finished the novel, and I looked at it, and I read it, and went over and over, and I said, why don't I just try? And this thing was really awful. And I, I found a, um, an agent who actually said, yes, we want to represent your book. And I didn't have to pay anything, just the um, monetary, you know, little bits of money here and there for when they were going to uh, propose it to a, a publisher. Well, they really weren't legitimate. And uh, I found that later on when I, when I realized they weren't doing anything for me. And all of the compliments I got for group should have been a red flag. Mm -hmm. um, so I then felt horrible and I said, I'll never write again. But then I it just was there. The words are there. The, the, the drive is there. So even if I were going to just write for myself, I had to write. So I picked up the computer and, uh, and knocked out my second novel, which was a little better than the first, but still not up to anything I'd want to put out there. And it, it was about the time my husband and I were uh, vacationing in Hawaii and I got a real urge, a real um, strong desire to write a, a novel that took place on the Big Island of Hawaii. So while I was there, I gathered information about the landscape and road, road names and, and things like that. So when I put the novel together, I would use authentic, actual places that people could relate to. And uh, that was my first novel, Dark Paradise. And I, I really had a, a wonderful time writing it. And I, I did send it out to some um, publishers. And I got a publisher who wanted to publish it. It was a small print-on-demand publisher. And uh, so that's, that's where this book comes from. And it's my, it was my first one. And if I had to do it over again, of course, we all know you'd rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it and fix up all the parts that you don't now like. Um, but I, I was so pleased and so happy that the rejections had stopped coming because the first time I ever got a rejection, I wanted to just burn my computer. I was never going to write it again. I was going to go live in a convent, whatever. <laughs> and I, I just did not think I, I could make myself write again. But when the drive is there, you do it and you start writing again. And then you say, well, I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them that, you know, I'll make them sorry. When I write a Pulitzer Prize winning novel, all these people who rejected me are going to be begging me. And I say, no, thank you. Um, well, you know, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, but uh, I, the way I write is without an outline. I have this story idea in my head. I know 
where it's going to start and where it's going to end and filling in the middle is the, is the part that is the biggest challenge. Uh, I found too that I, did, I don't write nonfiction because I thought there was just too much research, research going into it. When I have the urge to write, I have to sit down and start writing, start writing my story and whatever comes out. I, every sentence I write gives birth to the next sentence. And that's how I write, even though I know where I'm going most of the time. Sometimes there are gaps in the story and I have to get away from it for a while, so I, I generally have more than one thing right, uh, going on at the same time as far as writing. Um, so I can pick up on one novel when I'm stuck on the other one, and generally that works itself out. Um, so the second book that I had published was Pale Angel. I, well, I have to give you some background here. The first few books I wrote that no one will ever see um, are Westerns, because I grew up in the 1950s, and TV Westerns were all I ever watched. I loved Westerns. I mean, the horses and the... The, the settling of the West and the whole panorama of, of the romance was there, and I, I just, I couldn't get away from it. So the first stories I wrote were Westerns. Um, then I, I came to realize that today's, especially women writers, or readers, want to see a, a, a strong heroine. They don't want the typical perils of Pauline type of heroine who needs always to be rescued by the hero which many times all the Westerns I've watched, that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, so I started looking at writing a stronger heroine, a heroine who knew um, how she wanted her life to go, and who very often saved the hero. <laughs> uh, so I, I wrote Pale Angel, which takes place in East Texas uh, in post post-Civil War times, and it's about a, a woman, well, a girl, she's, she's, I think she's 21. And um, for that, I'll just read the back of the book so you get an idea of what it's about. In 1868, East Texas, Raven Inverness flees her father Gregory's abuse, and her life will never be the same again. Sean, her devil of a brother, Ivy the housekeeper and Raven's confidant, and Daniel Walker, an injured stranger she finds in the eerie day out, all hold secrets which could destroy her life or lead her to an incredible happiness. But Raven's own lies may trap her in their web. Family secrets can be killers. And that pretty much gives you an idea of, I like to write about family secrets, and I didn't, I didn't even do this consciously. As I wrote in all my books, there was some kind of family secret. And there was also the perennial battle between good and evil. I, I always had to have a really evil force of person in the story that drove it from another direction rather than just a romance or um, a piece of history. I had to have someone in there pushing all the wrong buttons. Um, so I would like to read just the first paragraph of this book so that um, to get an idea of how I started it off. This is, again, East Texas, 1868. Numb with an eerie chill seeping into her bones, Raven pre prevented her gaze from probing too deeply into the darkness. Her spirit plummeted like a stone into an abyss, with panic waiting to snare it. She curled her toes inside her slippers and turned an ear to the night. Another sound whispered beneath the buzz of the cicadas and the song of the tree frogs. Was it the rustle of her skirts as they trailed across the sedge and twigs? No. Her clothing hung limp and heavy with the mist that sifted through the Texas bagel. She clutched the shawl at her neck and tried to ignore the smell of rich, wet earth, reminding her of a newly turned grave. That was the how the story, and some people say, oh, it sounds like it's going to be a horror story. <laughs> no, it's just kind of setting the mood for the beginning of the story and, and kind of introducing you to her um, perilous life. Uh, the fourth book I wrote, well, the third, I should say, the third that I published was this book of short pieces, um, 
poems and little character descriptions and uh, things that were accumulating on my computer. And I didn't know what to do with them, so I put them together in a book that I gave my family members one Christmas. <laughs> and in it, I, I include a poem I wrote to my husband on the occasion of our 40th anniversary. And um, I won a little prize with it um, in a small poetry journal. But this was fun to do because I had all these odds and ends, and I could finally tie them all together and, and make something. The most recent book I published was Never Invite a Seagull to Lunch, which I did with my grandchildren. Uh, we would go to Cape Cod beaches many times and uh, always watch the seagulls steal food from everyone. And so we got in the habit of taking water pistols. So when they came near, we just squirt them a little on them. That's really it's like, water in my face? I'm a seagull. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I gave the kids um, the idea of let's do a book together. And then they came up with different instances. Like this is one of my favorites. My, my uh, grandson, Dylan, uh, did this one was uh, when your lips turn blue and you come out of the water, you know how your parent, how your parents really get upset about that. Um, we, and it, um, we go through lots of different incidences on the beach to teach kids um, or to let them know what's appropriate and what isn't. Um, here, uh, just on this one page, people are throwing sand at each other, and the uh, the text goes. Throwing sand doesn't make people very happy. For some reason, they get very annoyed when sand gets all over them. Their food, their towels, their blankets. At the beach. Go figure. So um, it's a book that kind of tries to teach kids, but with a tongue-in-cheek uh, little uh, attitude so that they don't feel like they're being lectured. Uh, and I got a, a five-star uh, recommendation from Reader's Favorites online um, for the book. For that reason, that that um, it it talks to kids kind of you know in a, in a happy way without lecturing them. Um, I see yeah. my time's <laughs> uh, Couple minutes more. Uh, so that basically that encapsulates my writing career. Uh, I I don't write to make money or I write for the pleasure it gives me and when I have something I think is good enough to share I will well three of these are self-published uh, I did have another book with a publisher our contract was that the book would be out in two years and after the third year I kind of cut ties with the publisher um, because she I found too she was trying to make the book into her own words uh, that's another problem I found with working with a publisher, uh, not particularly with this, the first one, that they were very happy with whatever I wanted and they just, you know, a couple of little changes here and there. With the publisher for a book that I'm still hoping to publish sometime, Trinity James, another Western, um, but Trinity has just got, got my interest. I, I, I need to get her out there. And she, uh, she's a feisty young girl who's being accused of murder, and her longtime friend is now hmm, a Texas Ranger. And uh, so, you know, he's on her trail. Um, there's a lot of backstory about how she got to where she was, and um, I'm hoping to uh, get that down to 100,000 words, because I had a publisher interested in it. It was 110,000 words. And trying to get 10,000 words out of a story is not an easy thing. <laughs> I've gotten 5,000 words out, and I still have 5,000 to go. Um, but what I'm currently working on um, is a contemporary novel, again, about family secrets, but it, um, it touches on the um, terrible um, societal plague of child abuse um, of uh, the church and uh, of again, family secrets that all blend together in, in making um, this woman who she is. Uh, so that's what I'm working on now. The name of that book is uh, Broken Dolls. And hopefully I'll finish that in the near future and try to get it out there. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much. How about a hand from Rosa? Um, so you can see, 
the, the adventure of, of the writing life, right? Uh, it carries you to far, far flung places and writing about cowboys and leprechauns and who knows what. Um, how about questions? I would love to know, uh, Carolyn, how often um, you spend writing oral art during the day. Like, is it every day, some days, one hour, six? How, uh, the question was, how often do I spend in, with my writing or my art? Uh, it's most days, and it varies. Um, recently, it's been mostly my art because I am um, illustrating a series of books for another artist. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so that, but even on those days, I'll occasionally jump into my book and see what I can develop you know, as you know, the next part of it. Um, but on the days that I do decide I'm going to write right from the beginning, um, I usually write you know, a few pages, uh, but it has to be in the morning. I mean, that's when my most creative time is. Yes. <laughs> Question. Um, the Pale Angels took place in Texas. Yes. And then your other book that you talked about also has a check. You talked about Texas Ranger. Is there a connection? Do you have a connection with Texas? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was where the cowboys <laughs> <So> lived. <laughs> and uh, it just, I've been to Texas and I've traveled, you know, I've seen some of the places that I've incorporated into the book, not anything really um, detailed. But I, I do have friends and relatives in Texas. Um, it just is so big, and there's so there's so many different types of land, um, mountains and deserts and you know, bagel, which which is word for a marshy swamp. Uh, so it's not a bagel; it's a bagel. Um, so uh, I try, and I also I bought a lot of books that um, about the flora and fauna. And so when I write, I can stick in the words that people are going to, to uh, look up. When you write something, if you say it was, there was a hurricane in 1949 in this place, people are going to look that up. <laughs> so with the, with the internet, you can actually find those details and, and make your, your descriptions accurate. <laughs> More questions? Do you have that with you? I just had a question um, for Catherine. You know when you met Nellie McCormick? What was she doing sitting all by herself in this schoolhouse? No, she was in her own house down the road. Oh, okay. So, yeah. maybe, so you bring me to the schoolhouse and she's sitting there. No, no and I'm not the schoolhouse. I just walked by her house and heard the music. It sounded friendly, so. Yeah. And the other thing I was thinking, just thinking, it really wouldn't be practical to publish, you know, your family history, but I would love to have you come, like, for an hour someday and yeah. just give a talk on, your, you know, everything about your family history that you discovered. I think it would be really interesting to do that. Yeah, so I, I, I made a few note cards for today, and I didn't even look at them, and I didn't <laughs> talk about it, but <laughs> things about how all that <clears throat> studies in family history and family therapy and social work, <clears throat> that as a result of that, I saw all these interactions in the family mm -hmm. and all the different roles that were being played <clears throat> in Ireland and still carried over here. Mm -hmm. And um, in the classism that exists in Ireland, my mother being a farm girl and my father's family being, so all that, you know, sociology, it all sort of figured into analyzing it all, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, so I, I didn't, you did a great job talking about the process. I, I got carried off and didn't oh, talk at all. Oh, <laughs> but um, it was fascinating. that was fascinating. like any answer to your question, how do you get here? Mm -hmm. By pushing it. Like, you know, there's act one and two in your life. <laughs> yeah. And then by the time you get to act three, one and two are like part of you, and they just come out a little mm -hmm. nilly. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, Jim is involved in uh, theater, so. If she's going to rope you in on something, I'll bet she's going to be using that brogue of yours. Oh, right there. <laughs> I love that. Isn't that gorgeous? I love that. Oh, I love that. Yes. Oh, how about some other questions? Any? Yeah. I was wondering, you found a publisher for Dark Paradise. Why do 
Why don't you go back to the same publisher for um, other books? Right? They uh, were. They, the question was, why didn't I go back to the same publisher? Um, they went to find. Oh. Uh, they, one of the uh, head editors died, mm -hmm. and after that, the business That's kind of just went out, you know, down. But uh, thank you for the question. Mm. And how how did you find the publishers? How do you? So, am I correct that the, the next two books are not published yet? They're going to be published by a publisher? You have someone already? I have, uh, the question is, do I have a publisher for my next two books, and how do I find publishers? Uh, no, I don't have a publisher other than myself. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I hope to. Uh, the next two books, I definitely will look for a publisher. I used to use a website called Predators and Editors, <laughs> which, which listed every publisher around the world practically, and gave you their reputation. Um, they gave you a rating. Most of them were very bad. Um, you know, the, the ratings were, you know, they don't pay their authors, they're, you know, charlatans. Um, but that website, I think, was sued by a few uh, publishers <laughs> and uh, is now defunct. But the web, the web is the first place I would go to to look for publishers because they're now, very specific, especially small publishers who um, you know are the big names. Uh, some uh, publishers publish, you know, um, antique lamps and books about Mon uh, Montgomery Cliff. <laughs> no, so, and that and that's that's true. And that very close to that, if, uh, what I remember. Um, they they narrow the, themselves into one category because they don't want to be inundated, I guess, um, with more than they can handle. <laughs> I'm like Carol. I've mostly, I've only self-published, and um, I think part of this is that I just want to be in charge of the whole project. Mm -hmm. So, like when I, when I, you know, ten years ago when I was, I first looked into some of those print-on-demand services that were just coming about. It was a big industry then, and um, when I asked one of them if they're interested in this, it turned out. They, they didn't have the, the presses to do a landscape type um, chip. It would have to be portrait. Um, and I knew this had to be landscape because of all the um, scenes. So I formed my own publishing company called Celtic Connections. I got, I got the ISBN numbers. I, got, I, um, I even got a tax number, thinking I'm going to make some money. <laughs> but how insane was that? I got a tax number. Yeah. And I even, I think, passed, filed a tax return for the first three years. But you're entitled to not have any. After three years, it can just be considered like a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and the other thing is, I don't want any publisher messing around with my story. I write it for myself. I don't care if anybody likes it other than me. And I, I love to do my own editing. I've done editing for other people sometimes. And um, you know, maybe it's the Irish in me, we rebellious. We don't want anybody to tell us what to do. And I was lucky enough to um, find this Joan Lawson, who lives in a vineyard, who happened to be Irish born, an Irish immigrant herself, um, and trained in, our, in Ireland. I happened to be here at one of the uh, kickoff conferences and um, liked her work, so she's been the illustrator for both of these. So, um, how about fan self publishing? Oh, I, am, I am too, and I agree. Um, sometimes, as the experience I had with the book that has not yet been published but is finished, uh -huh. um, I, I found the, the publisher just had too many things she wanted to change, and a lot of it had to do with my voice, with, with the way I say things. And plus, she got me a little concerned when there were a few things that, uh, words, and she didn't know what that word meant. I was looking up. <laughs> also, she, when I wrote about the landscape in Texas and, and describing the different plants and things, she said, nobody's not going to know what that is. Well, isn't that one of the purposes of writing a book? Is you people learn yeah. things from it. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know what kind of flower that is, look it up. <laughs> yeah. I mean that, that that so that kind of yes. I love to come across a word that I have never seen before because that's happened too often. But when I do, I'm like, 
wow, how do you seen this word? You can find out what that is. Yeah, so for me, it's exciting to come across something I'm not familiar with. I wish my publishers thought that. Yeah, well, one of them are morons. I think about books all the time. And I read the, well, I used to read the first 100 pages before I made a decision on whether I wanted. Now I read the first 50, because I'm just that much older. And in 10 years, I'll read the first 10. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, you know, like, somebody published this? Like, really? And it's really good. It's so, mm -hmm. it, it, so you can't trust it. You can't. can't. You just can't. Mm -hmm. And it is garbage. There are a lot of um, hints people give to writers as to how to better your writing. On. If, if you have time, if you don't mind, I'd like to read The Midnight Muse and Chicken Lips. Sure. If, uh, yeah. it's, a short, it's a short piece I wrote. It's kind of satirical about the idea that you're to, even by your bedside you should have a pen and paper because you get those flashes of brilliance in the middle of the <laughs> and you need to write them down. Now this uh, is in my... Okay, this is a collection? Yes, this is the collection. This is called The Midnight Muse and Chicken Lips. I'm a writer and a reader and some of what I read is about the art of writing or the techniques or the mechanics or the suggestions. Ah yes, the suggestions. There are a few things that any two writer's advice books agree on, but there is one that seems to sift through most of the time. It stresses the importance of keeping a notebook and a pen at one's bedside to capture those flashes of brilliance as they skyrocket through one's mind like a comet on its way to the other side of the universe. In compliance with this, I do have a nicely chosen notebook and a gel pen at the ready, most of the time. Sometimes, though, that pesky little devil of a notebook finds its way downstairs on another important message-carrying missions, like buy shampoo or call the dentist, <laughs> and, it, and it consistently forgets to come back upstairs. One night, as I was preparing for another bout with Morpheus, I sat bolt upright in bed. Okay, that's a cliche, but I really did it. It happened. The perfect sentence had made its way into my brain. I mean, the perfect sentence. It had nothing to do with anything I was currently writing, but I could write a novel around it. <laughs> It was my ticket to the Pulitzer, and it was in my head. I reached for my notebook. Uh-oh. Space next to my gel pen was empty. Damn, the little devil had slipped away again. I couldn't chance going downstairs. Inspiration was fragile, and I might just get jogged out of my drowsy mind. <laughs> Surely there must be something else I could write on. This was an emergency. I opened the top drawer of my nightstand. My hand groped amongst emery boards, cuticle scissors, crossword books, Old Mother's Day cards, 20-year-old pictures of my kids in diapers, that cute little clay thing my youngest had made for me in grammar school, and a dozen pens that had dried up over the last five years. The cards started to look good for the test, though I really didn't want to deface those cute messages. Finally, my hand touched something at the back of the drawer. It was paper. At least it felt papery. I carefully withdrew the sought-after item. It was the cocktail napkin I had brought home, brought home as a souvenir from our last trip to Hawaii. At the time, I thought it was cute. A line drawing of a pig's head adorned one side. She was winking and wearing a leg. Aloha Joe's was printed underneath. I wondered if that little piggy ever considered the fact she might be the featured guest at the next luau. <laughs> no matter now, I had to write. I picked up my gel pen and began to write. But my favorite writing instrument was going dry and I threatened to tear through the napkin. I tossed the pen into the drawer with its brothers. My fingers again searched. My frustration grew as my hold on the perfect sentence became more tenuous. <laughs> I found what felt like a pencil, one of those archaic writing instruments I had nearly forgotten about. I pulled it out. It was a pencil, all right, but not the writing kind. It was a lip line, the pretty mauve line I had lost track of months ago. This would have to do. I put it to napkin. The point had been worn down so it was even with the wood. Pencil sharpener. I know I have one. One of those small ones that kids used, used to carry to school in their book bags. That's right, book bags, ages before backpacks. Hand back in the drawer. Luckily, the desired item was at the front under that receipt, receipt for the shirt I bought my husband for Christmas, or the Christmas before. Anyway, I carefully pushed the non-point of the pencil into the sharpener and turned once, twice, and a half. The soft lead of the lip liner wouldn't take too many turns before breaking off. Ah, oh, great, <laughs> it was time to write. I wrote as fast as I could, convinced I had caught those words by the tail and flung them onto the paper just in time. I was done. 
Now I could sleep. In the morning, I woke, eager to start making a name for myself. I put my glasses on and reached for the napkin that seemed to be breathing with a life of its own. I read the words. Something wasn't right. My perfect sentence had turned into something weird. I had been lips grinning and Grange chicken lips pitched to eyes brown. What? I stood up and adjusted my glasses. Sure, that was it. I couldn't see clearly. I read it again. Same thing. I squeezed my tormented brain to make something of this. Was this my, my own personal Jabberwocky? No, this was my Pulitzer Prize winning novel starter. <laughs> Wait, maybe this was some kind of free verse I had compiled. It was, poet, it was the poetry muse, after all, who visited me. Of course, I read it again and again. I paced back and forth, concentrating on the words as though I were trying to learn lines of the script. Maybe this was something only my midnight mind could understand. That night, as I once again settled into my comfy nest, head against pillow, shoulder against husband, I knew that if my muse struck again, I would return the favor. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God.